Active. You can hear me from this guy? Yes. So I better be quiet if it's very active. Okay, thank you so much for, uh, for asking me to do something with this uh, panel. And uh, what I am going to show uh, or share with you uh, is really an ongoing research that I have been working on it for about 20 years or so now uh, with the purpose of uh, trying to figure out what happened in the later Islamic civilization period, a civilization or a period that I have classified in 1994 as really the golden age of Islam against everybody else's um, uh, uh, use of that term which left it between the 8th and the 12th century. I claim in a book that I published at NYU in 74 and 94 that the real golden age happens after the 13th century. And what I will share with you today is the facilities or the, the techniques with which we can determine the originality that was going on in that, uh, in that period and the kind of results that actually um, uh, uh, could be achieved with it. And, uh, oh, this is the flipper, I have to be in here. Okay, so if I were to flip it, I have to, to rest in here. Uh, this, the sum total of this book that uh, I didn't choose the cover for it, by the way, um, because aesthetically, as far as I'm concerned, this is not the best book cover I've ever seen in my life. But nevertheless, these people, they, publishers always choose their own covers and uh, they don't listen to me. Now, uh, what I will show you that after the 13th century and starting with these people that I have them listed here, uh, that commentaries begin to actually have a tradition of their own. Like if they begin to develop a school, there will be a major text, for example, as we see here, the Almagest from Ptolemy 150 AD. Tusi comments on the text of Ptolemy and then he also renders this text. And to just give you a clue, all the red arrows are arrows that produce original material. Uh, the, uh, the green arrows are only arrows that <coughs> signal authorship. And the blue arrows are the arrows where new, fresh theorems were actually introduced. So you could see by just visual part that we have a whole array of negotiations of people talking to each other, starting from a major classical text in 150 AD, but ending up with a text in the uh, 1550 in here, all through reading each other, commenting on each other, and I will give you examples of how they indeed interpreted each other. And I wish I had a flipper so that I can flip them and move around, and I don't have to move around in here. And I'll do that. Oh, you will? Yeah. Okay. So I will say next, and then when you do that. I'll give you an example. The, remember the guy that's called Tusi that we just say he wrote on the Al Majest? meaning the very first commentary that I'm using here, and the kind of voice that he used is my indicator of what, how original he was. He gives us, for example, in this text that he called Tahrir al-Majesty, literally sort of a new commentary on the majesty, on the al-Majest, by the way, is a famous astronomical text, everybody knows what it is. And then when he reached a section in it where Ptolemy is talking about the latitude theories of the planets, Tusi steps in, and what does he say? He says, Before that, he would say, Ptolemy says this, Ptolemy says, Ptolemy says this, and then he says, I say now. And that's the voice of the author now. They say, I say what Ptolemy has been saying is utter nonsense. When he says, أقول, خارج, is equivalent to say this kind of conversation is good for cocktail parties, but it is not, it is not good as science. And hence he says, because, again, he doesn't throw these accusations and move on. He says, because he failed to do it, let me tell you, I can do much better. And here he introduces a new mathematical theorem that solves the perplexities that Ptolemy could not solve. So here we have a fresh new creation happening in the year 12. 47 when he was writing for the first time when everybody thought that that period is a dead decline period and no Islamic science was happening and so on and so forth. Next. 
That specific theorem, he wrote it first in 1247, by 1259, he realized it's a very fecund theorem, that it has all sorts of other implications. And now he decided to take it up and give it a formal proof, treat it mathematically, like a very reasonable uh, mathematician would do. And then if he had, he uh, rendered for us four different shots of how these planets, I mean, uh, sorry, how these spheres move around each other. Purpose of it is that two spheres moving one this way, the other the opposite way, generating a linear motion up and down. Meaning, it's exactly what you do in your cars, by the way. Every time your car moves, it is rendering a linear motion of the piston into a circular motion on the wheels. So that is exactly what Tosi said. We can formalize this. We can create this theorem, and it will be usable as we finally use it in the cars and so on. Next. But here is an example of how a creative mind of 1247 transforms it formally, and he is confident that he is doing something completely original in 1295. And then, bingo, we find this theorem proven here mathematically in 1259, but then 300 years later, the very same theorem is proven mathematically by none other than the famous Copernicus of the Renaissance, where he is also saying there is a way of rendering circular motions into linear motions using exactly the same theorem. And the late Willy Hartmann of Germany discovered something more interesting. He says, look, where the Arabic has alif, the Latin has a. Arabic has ba, the Latin has b. Arabic has jim, the Latin has g. Arabic has ha, the Latin has h. Arabic has dal, the Latin has says, what's going on? <laughs> this is like a guy is not, does, not even, does not even name the geometric points with his own invention. He copies them right out of the Arabic text and uses them. And from there on, this text has become part of the corpus of Copernicus. Now, if you want to say that Copernicus was not of the epitome of the new production of mathematics, then it's OK. We will say him and Tusi let them belong to an age of decline. Next one. But now when we begin to look, as I said, at the commentators who took up the work of Tusi, and they began to add to them new ideas. And where do we begin to find their own statements of originality? I notice, for example, that this guy by the name of Khafri, to whom, by the way, the book is dedicated because uh, most of the original material was written by this man who died in 1550. He is writing a commentary on Tusi, but he calls the book, he says, التكملة في شرح التذكرة. Meaning, somebody before him had written a commentary on the Tazkira and failed to solve all the problems. So now he says, this is a completion of the failed project. So now you can see there is a legacy. There are people creating, and he is continuing the creation as a In it, he says, Auretu fihi mastambattuhu. You see, what I have discovered, or what I have fished out of the works of other people, of beneficial things, and then together with what my ekstakhrajtuhu, what I extracted out of al qasira with my poor intellect. Look how humble the poor guy is. He's the best mathematician ever produced, by the way, in the Islamic civilization. And he says, my poor, feeble mind. That's what I can conclude. And then he gives us all of the material that goes on to only signal that this is a very confident creator of new ideas. But now he's putting them in the context of a commentary on a commentary. It's not even one level of commentary. It's dumb. And the next one. And then he says here, when he picks up the text of Tusi, where Tusi expressly says that he could not solve, in the Tazkirah, he could not solve the movements of the planet Mercury. The planet Mercury, by the way, is a very notoriously bad planet because it's so close to the sun, nobody can actually see it, and it's very hard to actually get accurate information. And so Tusi says at this juncture, if I'm lucky and find a solution, I will insert it in the future at this position in my book. So Khafri says, no, nah, God forbid, I will tell you that I can do it right now. I, have, I don't have to wait. Then, so in other words, he uses it as an excuse 
the failure of an earlier astronomer to create his own le legacy on the basis of it. Next one. And then he says, this is the first solution that Ptolemy gave for the planet Mercury, which is not sufficient. He says, I, on the other hand, have found several solutions to where Ptolemy has failed and Tusi has failed. And the first of them, he says, Ahadwa, one of them, and he gives us just, you don't have to understand <laughs> astronomy, by the way. Uh, all you have to do is visually, you see how different the mathematics that is used here from the simple mathematics that Ptolemy <coughs> had used in the 150 AD or so. So that's the first solution. Then next one. Second solution gets a little bit more complicated. Next one. Third solution gets even a little bit more complicated. All of this. And then he goes to the fourth solution. I don't think that. Yeah, the fourth solution, he tells us it was not his, but he borrowed it because it was a genius idea as well. And when you collect them, you have the solution of Ptolemy. That's, by the way, I'm sorry, I have to take a little remark here. Don't ever change your, uh, 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 your uh, PowerPoint from a window to a Mac because the Macs, they don't have any more good fonts. They are no longer playing as computers. They are little toys. And hence, all of these horrible things are inserted by, by the Mac. Look the elegance of what we have here in the font. Now, he collects now all the four solutions that he had put together. What is he saying? He is saying that this problem, that Ptolemy messed it up, and Tusi could not solve it, I can solve it not in one way, I can solve it in four different ways. And each one of them is a brilliant mathematical solution. Simply saying at the same time that there is no unique solutions to natural phenomena. Mathematics is only a tool to describe natural phenomena. And if I am given it's a natural phenomenon. I can describe it mathematically by a whole variety of vectors connected. And there is an infinite number of, of vectors. Hence, transforming the idea of how mathematics is used to describe nature to say that it is just another language to use it. Next one. Then he also says, at the time when he reaches in another book of his, when he reaches uh, the, 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 the higher level of it, and then he says, now, not only four, I have found five solutions. And these are, he lists them. And notice he doesn't list them with any diagrams. That will have, if we have time, ask me about it. I'll tell you why these people do not use diagrams. So that you will, you know, we'll, we'll go a little bit into the mechanism of how these people produce their science. Next one. And then he says, all of these are so that he can actually produce at the very end a book that he calls Risala Hal Ma La Yan Hal so that he can produce a simple small book at the very end that he calls a treatise on the solution of <coughs> things that are insoluble meaning that all previous astronomers could not even solve them and have already <coughs> surrendered and said they are not solvable he actually managed to solve them in this very short treatise, which has a horrible handwriting, but nevertheless, once you read it, you know exactly what he is talking about. Next one. And uh, here again, when he speaks about it, he refers to this solution, for example, in this last treatise, he refers to this solution by saying, saying that I was uniquely and, and, and graced by discovering it myself. So to mean also that this is not writing a commentary anymore. He's using the voice of the author to say now that it is a unique production, it is original production, and indeed what he is describing is a production that's perfectly uh, uh, acceptable and uh, mathematically solid. Next. I think I'm about to touch it. And then at the very end of it, he says, and this is how, again, these people are first humble, but at the same time, they cannot resist themselves when they really have fun. I mean, this is a mathematician who almost like had the same feeling Napoleon would have had if Napoleon had won Waterloo. Imagine the kind of joy. Mathematicians know about that, by the way. When you solve a problem, sometimes it comes to you at night when you are in dreams. And you see, if you just connect one more line of construction, oops, the whole problem is solved. The joy, the effervescence of it, 
And then what he says here, in the idraka misla had al amr. Now the translation, good, it's in English. I give you a translation here. He says the attainment of this weighty matter, meaning all of the solutions, is of such a degree of human power that it resembles magic and comes very close to being miraculous. To say this is, you know, this, this kind of beautiful production, he doesn't know how to describe it, but this is how he characterizes his own work. So all I'm saying in this last book is that people who have classified commentaries are just regurgitating other earlier works and not adding anything material. Uh, obviously, they have not read these texts. These texts speak of a deep strain of originality of people who are very conscious that they are original and claiming on the basis of what they have done and they have demonstrated that their work is very, very close to being a miracle and such a beauty of product. I think this is the last one because I can see 15 over 15. Thank you so much and now I can deliver this.